This episode is brought to you by our friends at Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary. CBTS exists to provide ministerial training in the context of a confessional local church. They are, among other things, confessional, Baptist, affordable, and accessible. They are also now fully accredited by the Association of Reformed Theological Seminaries. You can learn more about them at their website, which is cbtseminary.com. Org. Again, that is cbtseminary.org. The Covenant Podcast exists to discuss doctrine, theology, and the biblical worldview from a covenantal Baptist perspective. We pray that this resource will be edifying to you and glorifying to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's get started. Jimmy Johnson here with my co-host, Austin McCormick. Today, our guest is Josh Wilson, who is the pastor of First Baptist Church in Park Hills. He earned his Ph.D. in Old Testament and MDiv from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He also received his bachelor's from our common alma mater, Missouri Baptist University. And his wife's name is Sarah, and they have eight children. Welcome to the Covenant Podcast, Josh glad to be a part of it. Today we will be discussing Christ in the Old Testament. So Austin, you want to go ahead and get us started with the first question? Yeah, Josh, good to have you on the podcast today. The first uh, question that we have for you is, what is typology? Oh, great question. Um, well, I think that you can, for I guess the layman, describe typology as kind of looking at the Old Testament through the lens of Christ. So uh, with typology, uh, you would have what we would call an Old Testament type, which would be some kind of concept, but incomplete. And that incomplete Old Testament concept, what we call the type, points forward to, or we could say prefigures, a New Testament antitype, um, which we would say is like the completed concept, um, the concept in its fullness. Uh, So for instance, in the book of Romans, this is a very common one, uh, the Apostle Paul says that um, Adam uh, is a type of the one who was to come. And the Apostle Paul even uses that word type. Um, So if you think about it, Adam, he's the Old Testament type. He's the the incomplete concept. And Christ is the New Testament antitype. So he's the completed concept. And so the the typological relationship then uh, between Adam and Christ would be that Adam uh, as a type, is the head of the human race, and um, Christ is the antitype, the, the complete in the fullness form of the type. Uh, he is the head of a new human race, um, a, a redeemed humanity. And so uh, a topology is where you have an Old Testament type that prefigures uh, the New Testament antitype. Also, kind of related to that question, what, how would you define prophecy or Old Testament prophecy? Um, well, uh, prophecy is really a very broad term, and uh, I think you can describe it very simply as the mediation of God's words, uh, usually uh, through a prophet to mankind. So you can, dis- you can say that the whole Bible is prophetic because the whole Bible is God's words given to man. So that's prophecy. But I'm assuming, uh, you know, because you're, you're relating it to typology, that you're wanting to see, uh, you're wanting more of like what is predictive prophecy. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a more n- narrow category of prophecy. Um, and that's in which God mediates to man, his words, and these would be words concerning the future. 
Um, so that's that would be prophecy uh, in, in in like its predictive form. So yes, you were correct. Uh, as we are comparing typology and prophecy in our question uh, that we have prepared beforehand, and we do want to flush this out a little bit more. So we've discussed what is typology, what is prophecy, how are these two things related to each other, and how are they different? Okay, well, I think both typology and prophecy can be forward-looking, so they're looking to the future. Um, but typology is more of, uh, of an indirect look, and prophecy is more of a direct look. So um, I've, I've used this analogy before. I don't know how helpful it is. Hopefully it'll give people an idea. But I always see typology as like looking toward the future uh, with glasses, but the lenses are backward. All right. And so, I mean, just think about putting on some glasses and uh, reading glasses and then taking those lenses and then flipping them around. All right. So um, it's forward looking. The, the Old Testament prophets are using typology or they're not using typology, but they're giving us types and they know that they are forward looking. But the, the picture is kind of hazy. They don't quite have a good idea of of what is forward. However, with the coming of Christ, because remember typology is interpreting the Old Testament through the lens of Christ, um, with the coming of Christ would be on the other side, looking through those glasses normally. See what I mean? To where um, now with Christ, you can look back on the Old Testament through the lenses the, the way you would with regular eyeglasses, and it's, it all is clearer. You can see the uh, Christ in the New Testament more clearly. So from the Old Testament perspective, it's looking through those glasses with the lenses reversed. From the New Testament perspective, it's looking through those glasses with the lenses correctly aligned. Um, so that would be like typology, and prophecy would be different um, in that it would be like looking forward with a telescope. So a lot of times um, scholars will call this uh, prophetic telescoping. So, you know, it, it's like you'd have a telescope in front of you um, and you're looking at a landscape. And oftentimes the landscape that scholars will use is like that of a mountain range. So it's not as good as being there. Um where you can see more clearly the, the view, but you are able to see a clear view from a distance. Um, and so that kind of gives you an idea of typology is, you know, it, it's indirect. Um, prophetic uh, predictive prophecy is, is more direct. And uh, both of the views are much clearer when you get to the New Testament and you are there with the coming of Christ, if that makes sense. I hope that analogy makes sense. That is very helpful in my opinion. Um, also, you already gave one example of a type in Adam, um, Adam as a type of, of Christ, mm -hmm. but what are some other examples of types that we find in the Old Testament that help us to better understand who Jesus is and, and what he did or what he would accomplish? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, there's there are a number of types and types can be different things. Uh, so, for instance, the Exodus can be a type of God's ultimate deliverance of his people through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the day of the Lord can be a type uh, of the final day of the Lord. So in the Old Testament, you have what I call many days of the Lord, M-I-N-I, -I, small days of the Lord, um, where it's a day of judgment for a nation. But those ultimately point forward to a full, real, final, ultimate day of the Lord in the second coming of Christ. Um, the Passover lamb uh, is also a, a type of, that points to Christ, because Paul in 1 Corinthians says that Christ is the Passover lamb. Um, so those are different types that you can have in the Old Testament. But I think the clearest types from the Old Testament 
um, that not only point to the coming of the Messiah, but also help us to understand who he would be and what he would do would be those mediatory offices of the Old Testament. Um, the, the office of the prophet, the priest, and the king. And those three offices are, um, they're not first introduced to us in Deuteronomy, but in Deuteronomy 17 and 18, they're all grouped together to kind of give the Israelites the idea that um, these, are, these are offices, these are ministries that are going to be uh, held while Israel is a nation. And, and one of the ways that we can know that these offices and these office holders are all types that point to Christ is that, first of all, the New Testament is said, uh, says that Christ is the holder of all of these offices. But also the Old Testament tells us that all of these offices are going to be perpetual. God is never going to put an end to these offices, um, the office of the prophet, the priest, and the king. So, and that's, that's really important, you know, because we want to make sure that uh, we don't read uh, types and anti-types into the text that aren't there. We don't want to allegorize texts. Um, but when you have uh, the New Testament and the Old Testament confirming itself in these various types, you know that you're on uh, solid, solid ground with respect to your interpretation of passages, Old Testament passages, and Old Testament types, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that answer. And as we move this conversation forward, um, what are some of the clearest Messianic prophecies that we find in Scripture? Um, <clears throat> well, I think, uh, you know, standing... In the Old Testament and looking forward, uh, I think some of the clearest messianic prophecies are those that speak of God establishing uh, and reestablishing the throne of David forever. Um, so, for example, in 2 Samuel 7, you know, that's where you have um, God making his covenant with David. And what does he say to him? You will never lack a man to sit upon the throne. Um, this is recounted in 1 Chronicles 17 as well. Um, and then Psalm 2, where David writes the psalm, and he's we can say it's a messianic psalm because David sees clearly someone greater than himself in Psalm 2, and he's talking about the, uh, the, the anointed one, the Mashiach, this Messiah, uh, will inherit uh, all of the nations. Uh, so those are messianic prophecies that talk about the establishing of the throne of David forever and him reigning over the nations. And then Psalm 89, which recalls that covenant promise that God makes to David in 2 Samuel 7, um, it, it, it's kind of saying, you know, God has made this covenant with David forever that, that David will never lack a man to sit upon the throne. And then at the end of the psalm, he says, okay. Well, the throne of David is in shambles. So, what are you doing, God? <laughs> what's what's the deal? And uh, and and then those are those are the messianic prophecies uh, referring to the establishment of David's throne. But then you have prophecies from the latter prophets, like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, that talk about the um, the reestablishment of David's throne. So um, uh, some of the big ones that I can think of is like Isaiah 9. You know, this is a very popular one during Christmas, you know, where it says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And, uh, and as you go through the prophecy, it says, and on the throne of David and over his kingdom, um, he, will, he will reign. Um, uh, Isaiah 11 is another big one uh, where it says, there shall come forth from the shoot uh, a shoot from the stump of Jesse. And of course, Jesse is David's father. Um, so it's making the hearer aware that this is a messianic Davidic prophecy and uh, just talking about a kingdom that is going to be set up and, uh, and reign forever. Uh, in Jeremiah chapter 33, 
It talks about that there's going to come a day in which God will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David that will reign and rule forever. Uh, Ezekiel 34 and Ezekiel 37, uh, where it talks about, you know, my servant David is going to be king over all the Israelites, and I'm going to establish my covenant of peace with them as an everlasting covenant forever. Um, and these are all prophecies that, that are after David's death. So you know that they're referring, they're looking forward to um, the time when a, a Messiah, a son of David, will come. Uh, Daniel chapter 7 is another one where it talks about the Son of Man coming on the clouds of glory. Um, it doesn't make specific mention of uh, David or of Jesse, but um, Daniel 7 is a passage that Jews, uh, even in their Talmud, recognize as a messianic, pa uh, messianic passage. Uh, so those are prophecies from the uh, viewing them from the Old Testament, looking forward to the new. I would say standing in the New Testament and looking backwards at the Old Testament, uh, some of the clearest messianic prophecies are like Psalm 22, where, um, you know, uh, it, it's uh, something that Jesus speaks when he's on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It talks about the people piercing his hands and his feet. Uh, but I think uh, one of the clearest ones is Isaiah 53. Um, I don't know if you guys uh, are familiar with this YouTube channel. It might not be the channel, but it's uh, it's this show called One for Israel. And it's a bunch of uh, Jewish Christians who live in Israel and uh, and try to bear witness for Jesus. And one of the things they'll do is they will uh, go out on the street and they'll talk to people about who they think Jesus is, and they'll read Isaiah 53 um, to these uh, to these unbelieving Jews, and they'll be like, "Who do you think this is?" And uh, <laughs> many of them will be like, "That sounds like Jesus." <laughs> and they're like, "We're reading this from our Bible," mm. so uh, very interesting. Uh. So those are yeah, these are the the messianic prophecies that I think are the clearest. Yeah, I think both Austin and I would agree with you on that. Also, another question as we kind of hone in on, on the person of Christ, it, it's not uncommon for liberal uh -huh. scholars to say that the Old Testament has no conveyance or, or, or teaches nothing that would convey that Jesus is either divine or that the Messiah would be divine, rather. Um, as well as a man. And then also modern day Jews would say that the concept of like the Trinity or something like that is nowhere in no way consistent with the Old Testament and in fact contradicts it. Um, so with that said, do we find anything within the Old Testament that conveys the idea that the Messiah would be both true God and true man? Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> You know, we talked earlier about types, you know, and uh, we can describe these as like types, shadows, prophetic telescoping. Um, uh, a key thing to remember uh, is that when we are in the Old Testament looking forward, uh, especially with respect to typology, we're looking through, <laughs> I'm going to use a phrase that the Apostle Paul says, a glass darkly. You know, a glass dimly or, or, you know, we're looking through seeing eyeglasses with the lenses reversed. And so it's not until the New Testament where you have the coming of Christ that things become very clear. And we can understand that the Messiah, Christ Jesus, is truly God and truly man. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't hints in the Old Testament uh, that we're that we're dealing with a messianic figure who would be uh, man and God. Now, for the Jews, I think they they would all agree that, yeah, of course, the Messiah would be a man. Uh, so the question is, is there any hints in the Old Testament that the Messiah would be God himself? And um, uh, there's two examples from the book of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews quotes Psalm 110 and Psalm 45. Uh, in Psalm 110, 
You know, you have the phrase, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So, you know, <clears throat> the Messiah uh, is someone that David, the king, the writer of the psalm, is calling Lord. David is seeing this person as greater than him. And um, it's not the same word in Hebrew. The Lord says to my Lord, you have Yahweh says to uh, Adoni, my Lord. Um, but in the Septuagint, they make them the same word. Uh, so that's, that's one example. Uh, Psalm 46 says, uh, your throne, O God, is forever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Here you have what seems to be God anointing God. And, you know, anointing is very key with the word Messiah because that's from the Hebrew word Mashiach, which is a, a Hebrew, Hebrew root meaning to anoint. And, uh, and again, the author of Hebrews quotes both of those passages to argue that Jesus is not only greater than the angels, but is himself Yahweh of the Old Testament. That's in Hebrews chapter 1. Um, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, this is the, the Christmas one that we quoted earlier, uh, that says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is a clear Messianic passage um, making reference to Mighty God. And then Zechariah 12, 10. And this is where basically God says um, he's going to pour out upon the house of David and the inhabitants of, Jer of Jerusalem spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me and on him, whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. So um, look on, there, this is God speaking. They look on me, the one they have pierced. Um, it just seems to, to be an indication that we're talking about God in some way, possibly coming in flesh. Uh, so those are some of the biggies, the, some of the biggies from the Old Testament that I think are hinting at uh, a divine Messiah. But again, you got to remember, you're, you're from the Old Testament to the New, you're looking through a telescope, and with respect to typology, you're looking with glasses, but with the lenses reversed, if that makes sense. I really like that analogy, and that is very helpful. Uh, this next question that we have written down, I'm interested to hear your thoughts about. Uh, some Christians treat Jesus as if he is the backup plan, as if Yahweh tried to save people through various ways throughout history, but each failed until Jesus. Why would you say that this type of thinking is wrong and that the Old Testament is, in fact, Christ-centered and Christian scripture? I, uh, When you guys sent me this, I, I was kind of thinking about how I was probably the same way. Uh, as I was growing up in the church, you know, listening to the stories of Israel and their failures and, and just kind of having this thought of, oh, well, Jesus must be the last ditch effort on God's part to try and, you know, make things right for his people. Um, but, you know, in your question, you know, you, you talk about some Christians, uh, seeing Jesus as the way, the final way that God is trying to save his people. And, uh, you know, a good question for lay people to think about is, okay, well, what is salvation? Because we always say, we talk about, you know, being saved. What is salvation? You know, is it just conversion? Is it just being made right with God? Um, well, salvation is actually an entire process in which not only are God's people being made whole, made complete to where they're completely free from their bondage to sin, 
They're completely free from their bondage to death. That, that process includes not just people, but all of creation. So when you go to the Old Testament, what, what, what does the Old Testament begin with? It begins with creation. But it's not there just to tell the Israelites where they came from. Um, I think the Bible starts with creation to show the Israelites uh, what God is taking them back to. Um, so, and I think this is kind of evident even early on in the book of Genesis. Um, you have Genesis 3.15, the first gospel where God says, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between her seed and your seed, the seed of the serpent. And obviously this is pointing to some seed, some son, some descendant. Well, what is he going to do? Well, he's going to crush the head of the serpent. But there's also the slight implication that that seed, that son, is going to restore things back to the way they were originally in Eden. And we get a hint of this when you go to Genesis chapter 5 and Noah's father, Lemek, uh, he names his son Noah. And what does Noah mean? It means rest. And he says, this is the one. I, I have a feeling that Lemek is thinking back to the, uh, the promise made in Genesis 3.15 and thinking maybe Noah is this seed. And he continues to say, who will give us rest from the toil of the ground that the Lord has cursed? So, um, if, if that is the purpose for the Israelites, that, that they are headed back to Eden, then the Old Testament is incomplete. And, and even a Jewish ordering of the Old Testament is incomplete. You know, the Jews have their own canon, um, that ends at Second Chronicles. And when I say they have their own canon, you know, they have their own ordering of the canon that ends at Second Chronicles. And what's the last pretty much thing that happens in Second Chronicles? Um, Jehoiakim is released from prison and has a seat at the king's table, uh, which means, you know, this, this descendant of David who's been taken into captivity, he's released from captivity, but the nation of Israel is still in disarray, so there's a to be continued. Um, with the Christian ordering of the canon with Malachi, uh, you know, it's a to be continued. We're waiting for the Lord to send his messenger and um, and for the Lord to come. Uh, so when you get to the New Testament, well, what does the New Testament do with an incomplete to be continued Old Testament, but pick right back up where the Old Testament leaves off? So you know, when you when you look at the Old Testament through the Christian ordering of the canon, Malachi says a messenger, an Elijah, is going to come. Well, in the New Testament, you have your first Gospels. They all harmonize with John the Baptist. That's the first place where the Gospels harmonize is with John the Baptist. Well, who is he? He is Elijah, who is to come in Malachi. So the New Testament picks right off, right up where the Old Testament leaves off. And then you look at where the New Testament ends. It ends with the restoration of all things in the person, person of Jesus Christ. And that's Revelation 21 and 22. And both of those chapters look back clearly to the Garden of Eden. Uh, I mean, you have reference to the tree of life and the, the ending of the curse. Um, so this whole story started in the Old Testament. And you can actually look at the, you know, the failures, what we would say is the failures of the Old Testament, like the Jewish nation. You know, people can read the Old Testament and see and say, well, what was the whole point of the failure of the Jewish nation? What was the whole point? Was this some experiment? And this may be the idea, may be where people get the idea that, um, you know, Jesus is God's backup plan because Old Testament Israel failed. Um, but you can look at that failure and see how it's part of the overarching plan 
to restore Eden. Because think about this. Uh, Jimmy, what did the collapse of the Jewish nation do to the Jewish people? It dispersed them into exile. It dispersed them, yeah. To where you, that's right, to where you have the diaspora, all right? And, well, when the Jewish people dispersed, what did that do? Well, it caused the Jews to take their, their Old Testament concepts and, and even their Old Testament writings out of Israel and into the Gentile world. And so then with the coming of Christ uh, and his, his death, burial, and resurrection in Jerusalem, uh, you have Pentecost where the Jews who've been scattered throughout the Roman Empire and into the Parthian Empire— they're all back in Jerusalem to celebrate, you know, the, the various feasts, and Peter preaches the gospel to them, and many of them come to faith in Christ. And those who came from out of town and became followers of Christ, well, what did they do with the gospel once they went back home? They probably took it and spread it. And then when the apostles go out on their missionary journeys, where are they going? They're going into the synagogues first where you have Jews and Gentiles, who would be like converts and God-fearers, hearing the proclamation of the gospel. So that failure of the Old Testament would be a tool that God would later use to advance the reign and rule of Christ through the power and pro proclamation of the gospel. So you see how Christ can't be plan B. Christ is the continuation and the conclusion of the story that started in the Old Testament. Amen to that. Um, we'll transition a little bit here to to pastors and preachers in particularly. Um, what are sure. what are some ways that pastors or or preachers can introduce their people to one the unity of the Bible, but also to the Old Testament when it can seem so foreign or disconnected from us? Yeah, I think one of the one way that, that pastors can begin helping their people understand the unity of the Bible is by showing them and teaching them that the Bible has one overarching story. And um, one of the easiest ways that, that a pastor can begin doing this is, uh, is by taking church people to the very beginning of the Bible, and then I'm talking like the first three chapters, and then taking them all the way to the very end of the Bible, the last three chapters, and just kind of show, okay, here's the beginning, here's the end, see how they relate to each other, and then say, okay, so what then do you think is the, the story of all the rest of those chapters of the Bible? And, um, you know, when I take, like, I'm taking the boys' Sunday school class through this, and uh, they know <laughs> the whole story of the Bible is the story of restoration. Um, and then once, once they get that idea of the overarching story of the Bible, then what you can do is start showing them how the individual stories, like Noah's Ark, Exodus from Egypt, David and Goliath, how all those individual stories relate to the bigger story, the story of restoration, the story of redemption, not just of mankind, but of all creation. So that's one way I think a pastor can do this. Another way, and this is something that I've done, is just grab some guys, start a guys group. I've got a guys group that meets uh, early in the morning every week. It's 6.15 a.m., um, and that's so that everybody can – Meet, talk, pray, and then go to work. Um, but grab a group of guys and uh, go through a, kind of a very lay-friendly book that lays out this overarching story of the Bible. So I've taken a group of guys through a book by Tim Chester called Create, From Creation to New Creation. And uh, I think I, I've, been, I've been meeting with these guys for some years now. I think I took them through a book by Graham Goldsworthy called According to Plan. Um, but those are, those are just two ways that, that I've 
tried to do that in my church by, um, you know, showing the overarching story and then taking some people through uh, a book that kind of lays that out. Josh, I'm really enjoying this conversation and particularly have enjoyed the types and shadows that you've uh, brought us to in the scriptures and uh, the conversation concerning prophecy. But this next question is a little bit more personal. Uh, What is your favorite Old Testament text that points us to the coming Messiah who we know has indeed come and will come again? And uh, why is this your favorite Old Testament text? Well, I actually have two, <laughs> but they relate it's okay. to each other. Um, I have uh, Daniel chapter 7, uh, where it says, um, basically, I saw the Son of Man coming on the clouds of glory, and uh, a, a kingdom was given to him, to him of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And, you know, it's a kingdom that's not going to pass away and not going to be destroyed. So that's the first one. And then the other one is Zechariah 9, 9, that says, you know, rejoice, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation as he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Um, Now, the New Testament uses both of those passages in reference to Christ. And one, the Daniel passage is in, or Uh, I'm sorry, the Zechariah passage is in reference to his first coming. And the other, the Daniel passage, is in reference to his second coming. Um, The reason I like these two messianic prophecies is because uh, the Jewish rabbis of the Talmud have a conversation about these two passages. And they see both of these passages as messianic. And they have a discussion about these two passages. And uh, one of the, it's kind of like when we look at Zechariah 9.9, we see he's coming on a donkey, but why would he come on a donkey? You know, I mean, if he's the king, if he's their Messiah, what, what shows a conquering king, but he's coming on a horse? And so they're, they're just curious. Why is he coming on a donkey? In fact, I think one of the rabbis even says, well, I will buy him a horse when he comes, just to make sure that uh, he has the proper animal to come. Uh, but a- as they have this conversation, they begin to say, well, okay, here's probably the difference between the two passage. If we're worthy of his coming, then he's going to come in glory, according to the Daniel 7 passage. But if we're not worthy of his coming, then he's going to come in humility, the Zechariah 9, 9 passage. So what I think is really interesting about these two messianic prophecies is here you have the Jews looking at them. They see both of them as in reference to Christ, but they see them as an either or prophecy. But in light of Christ, we know that these are both and prophecies. He's going to come both in humility and in glory, but their conversation about these two passages just really confirms what we already know of Christ. Um, and, and it's it's kind of one of those things where you just want to be like, guys, just just look, open your eyes, and see this is this is the reality of Christ Himself. So very interesting. Josh, you are my professor in both Greek and Hebrew, which are both classes that require a great deal of encouragement. Um, and also, this this Christmas season can be, be a time that we can easily be distracted from, from the true meaning of Christmas, if you will, um, as well as it can be a, a difficult time for people that may have families that are broken and and for various reasons. So what encouragements do you have for Christians this Christmas season? And and also, what encouragement can we draw from the fact that God has kept his messianic promises and revealed the substance of the shadows in the Old Testament in Christ? Yeah. Well, um, I think an encouragement that we can have during the Christmas season is to know that uh, there is a a very deep significance to the 
incarnation of Christ that I think right now in this present age is beyond our understanding. We may understand it fully when Christ comes, but right now there's a significance to it that is is beyond us. Um, and that is basically this whole grand narrative that we've talked about. And, you know, when when a pastor might teach people about that overarching story of the Bible, he can he can talk about how basically you, the the student, are a part of this story, this grand narrative. So this whole grand narrative of the Bible that that every church member, every human being is participating in, it all points to Christ. This whole grand narrative is summed up in the person of Christ. And uh, Ephesians chapter 1 talks about how God has a plan for the fullness of time, and that plan is that he is going to unite all things together in Christ, that Christ is the fulfillment, uh, is, is the fullness of him who fills all in all. And um, so, uh, the, you know, when we talk about typology in the Old Testament, which we've, do we've done a little bit, you know, and they can be things, events, or people in the Old Testament, uh, those types in the Old Testament, whether it's thing, event, or people, always are complete and fulfilled in Christ and, and not in anything else. So Christ is the fulfillment of the, the grand narrative of the scriptures, the grand narrative of this creation. And with his coming, we see that. And now we know that in some way we are partaking in this. We're partaking of God summing up everything in Christ. And one of the ways, one of the clearest ways that we're partaking of, of that is that we have been united to Christ. So uh, everything that's being summed up in Christ is being summed up with us, but only because we are in Christ, because of that union. So. Hmm. Well, thank you for those encouraging words. And uh, this next question will help uh, both Jimmy and I and all pastors and preachers. What books would you recommend to pastors on interpreting and preaching through the Old Testament? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I would say, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna take your people through the grand narrative of the Bible. Um, there are books, uh, for instance, by Greg Beale, uh, The Temple and the Church's Mission. Um, there's a book by a guy named Christopher Wright called The Mission of God, Unlocking the Grand Narrative of the Bible. Um, T. Desmond Alexander has put out two. Um, one is called The Servant King, and the other is called From Eden to the New Jerusalem. And The Servant King is, you know, just looking at the, the grand narrative of the Bible and how Christ is in that grand narrative of the Bible. So, um, you know, with these books on interpreting the Old Testament uh, through the grand narrative, I think it's I think it's very helpful for us to remember that when we look at the Old Testament, we're not interpreting it in a vacuum. Uh, we're we're doing interpretation through the lens of Christ. Um, now that Christ has come, we don't need to set aside Christ in order to interpret the Old Testament. Um, you know, uh, we don't need to say, okay, well, let's look at the context, but let's not consider Christ here. Uh, I think since he has come, we very much make him part of every interpretation. Um, with respect to preaching the Old Testament, um, you know, a good book uh, for me has been Preaching Christ from the Old Testament by Sidney Gradanus. And um, one that I cannot recommend more highly is uh, these very simple literary focused commentaries by a guy named Dale Ralph Davis. Um, I was turned on to these by uh, one of my church members. And um, he, I just feel like uh, Davis does a very good job of looking at the literature of like these Old Testament historical books and uh, 
and being able to, you know, kind of help you understand this is why this story is here in this passage. And uh, it's been it's been helpful to me in teaching and uh, and in and in some of the times that I've preached as well. But, you know, I, I would just encourage guys too when you preach from the Old Testament, you know, do it as the apostles did. <laughs> Make sure that if you have any unbelieving Jews within earsight, what you preach from the Old Testament would cause them to riot, <laughs> if that makes sense. You know, you don't want to preach something that they would say, yeah, I agree with that. That's very good. Uh, you want to preach something that um, calls for uh, faith in Christ as the only true uh, king, the only true Messiah, the only true son of David. You know, the, the apostles did that and uh, it caused them to, <laughs> it caused uh, riots in various cities. So anyway, those are some of the books that came to mind. Now we'll go ahead and transition and ask our final question on books for lay people. So what books would you recommend to lay people seeking to better understand the Old Testament and apply it to their lives, in addition to the ones that you've already mentioned? Okay. Yeah, um, well, I would, I've, I mentioned, I've actually mentioned all of these already, but like I said, with the, the guys group that I meet with in the morning, I've taken them through a book called According to Plan by Graham Goldsworthy, um, and then From Creation to New Creation by Tim Chester. Uh, and then I would also say uh, the commentaries by Dale Ralph Davis uh, are, are just as good for laymen, too. Um, there's just so much insight uh, into uh, his his view of the literary uh, aspect of basically Old Testament historical texts. Well, Josh, we want to thank you today for joining the Covenant Podcast. We're very grateful for you taking time to have this discussion with us. Yeah, I'm glad to be on. Well, like always, this episode is brought to you by our friends at Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary. CBTS exists to provide ministerial training in the context of a confessional local church. They are, among other things, confessional, Baptist, affordable, accessible, and accredited. Accredited. You can learn more about them at cbtseminary.org. That is cbtseminary.org. Thank you for listening to The Covenant Podcast. If you've enjoyed this resource, or you simply like The Covenant Podcast, Head on over to our iTunes page, subscribe, and leave us a review. We are also available via Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, and Podbean. Thank you for listening to the Covenant Podcast. Grace and peace to you.